Welcome to Three Questions With, a podcast for the Latino News Network produced in collaboration with Can TV. LNN is dedicated to best serving Hispanic Latinos with local multimedia news and information websites in the Northeast and the Midwest that include Illinois Latino News, a statewide community focused initiative. Three Questions With is a public affairs program elevating the voices and visibility of matters most important to the Hispanic Latino community by speaking with community and industry thought leaders on the social determinants of health and democracy. I'm Hugo Valta, publisher of LNN and your host. There are over 100,000 people waiting for transplants in the United States and 60% are from marginalized communities according to the Health Resources and Service Administration. Here's other sobering statistics. 17 people in the U.S. die each day waiting for an organ, and a new person is added to the national transplant waiting list every nine minutes. When it comes to kidney donations, the wait from a deceased donor is three to five years or longer. There are almost 90,000 people on the national transplant waiting list in need of a kidney. Hispanic Latinos are among the groups that most need transplants, but often don't get the life-saving operation because they lack the resources to obtain post-transplant medications needed to maintain the transplanted organ and their life. The Illinois Transplant Fund was founded in 2015 to increase access to organ transplants by targeting the inequity of health insurance access. Here to tell us more about transplantation and the work ITF leads is Catalina Ramos Hernandez, the organization's program coordinator. Catalina, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Now, full disclosure, I recently became a member of the board of directors for ITF, and I'm also an organ donor, and we'll get to that in a moment. But first, there are 16% of adults with incomes below 200% of the federal poverty level that are uninsured. This impacts low-income individuals, the working poor, people of color. The Illinois Transplant Fund focuses on increasing access to health insurance for qualified Illinois residents listed for organ transplants. Catalina, tell us about the work of ITF. Uh, yes, thank you, Hugo. Uh, unfortunately, yes, we have a uh, poverty, I think, every single state. In Illinois, we have uh, one of the uh, bigger uh, groups that are in the poverty are the Latinos. Uh, we have about 800 or 700,000 immigrants, and the majority of them hold the most uh, um, lower uh, pay paid uh, jobs. Actually, they do not have medical insurance, so the medical insurance, when they have access, is extremely uh, cheap. They do not cover the majority of services. Basically, is like not having uh, medical insurance, and one of the problems is that transplants are not covered for these plans. Uh, we work with uh, people who do not have access to uh, transplants due to medical insurance. At the beginning, we thought NITF was the product of the activism in the community because they thought that it was because they were undocumented, which is not true. Actually, the list, that is a list, and we are going to talk a little bit uh, later, do not require that you have social security number, do not uh, ask you where you were born, the, but uh, they require payment. When uh, people start talking about organ transplant, and that was in 2013, 2014, they were several people uh, got together and they said, we are being rejected by the transplant centers because we are undocumented. And they make a big uh, deal of this, and they said that is not true because actually, you know, Chicago is one of the sanctuary places. And uh, we found out that it was not because they do not have a social security number, it's because they didn't have the way to pay. Mm. Now the transplant center said, we are willing to do the surgery for free, but the problem is the medications that they need to take for life, and they are extremely expensive, sometimes three, four thousand uh, dollars per month. And who is able to afford it? The only way is to have medical insurance. And yes, at that time also, luckily, the um, Affordable Care Act passed, and everybody was able to buy medical insurance. It's not only because of the social security number, it's also because these patients have a medical condition, a chronic medical condition, that actually make them uh, 
not eligible for to buy medical insurance, or if they buy it, they are going to pay extremely high prices. So they they were able to buy medical insurance, and ITF is going to pay for the premium of that medical insurance for 36 months. Mm -hmm. Is how is is uh, start. We decided because the movement was in Illinois, because the fund, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, comes from Illinois. So is uh, the eligibility criteria is that they do not have access to Medicare or Medicaid, that they have lived in the state for at least three years, and that they have a medical insurance and they are registered or about to start the evaluation in one of the Illinois transplant centers. So it, it's, it's a multi-throng process. And as you said, the, the greatest need is for the medication after the transplants. ITF is the only organization in the country that is yes. providing this type of service yes. uh, to the community. I can't believe it's the only one. But part of it, as you said, is also because of we live in the state of Illinois. Chicago is a sanctuary city. Tell us a little bit about the unique con situation yes. that, uh, that provides ITF the opportunity to collaborate with not only hospitals, but funders in providing the service to the community who needs, th who needs this type of help. I think as any uh, movement, this needed a champion. And that is very important that there is people who want, are willing to do it. The same way that breast cancer in the past, or AIDS, or any other had champions and got the money together, I think that here it was uh, Kevin Simant, who was at that time the executive director of the OPO, the Organ Procurement Organization here in Illinois, that actually decided to champion and to help us. After the movement and after several demonstrations in the hospitals, just complaining that it was no access to uh, Transplant, organ transplants in the undocumented community, in the immigrant community, the, the governor passed a law actually saying, we are going to pay for the medication for life. And it was 45 million allocated to this uh, endeavor. What happened is that it was changed in government and that law was defunded, so no more money. And is when Kevin said, you know what, I think that we have enough money in the OPO to uh, start supporting somehow this organization and let's get together with the transplant centers. He brought together the transplant centers, talked to them, and they said, we are willing to give you some seed money. So they uh, start contributing money to pay for the premiums and how this uh, start. Kevin has been uh, an advocate, and uh, now ITF is the Illinois Transplant Fund, is an advocate and has been working with legislations, has been working with the transplant centers, really to continue the access, not only um, to pay the premiums, but also to educate the transplant centers and to educate the community about the different options and how to increase the opportunity for both to be successful. Because uh, organ donation is a gift, is, is a very precious. And what we want is not only to have the transplant, but also to be successful for many years. There are some transplants that last for five years. We have patients that have more than six, seven years now, and they are still in good uh, health. And the transplant centers are very happy because they said this community is a community that is proving little by little to be healthier than the rest of the community. Yeah, and, and, and as you said, education is a great part of maintaining the, that health uh, after surgery. And of course, the, having the financial means to, to get that type of help. Let's move on to uh, the second question, which is really, uh, again, continuing uh, the, the education. Specifically with the Hispanic Latino community, um, there's also some taboos when it comes to yeah. uh, being an organ donor. There are barriers, some of it in, in, our, in this country have to do not only culturally, but language. Tell us a little bit about the, the hesitation or perhaps the lack of information that helps Hispanic Latinos understand what it really is to become an organ donor, because the need is definitely there yes. in regards to needing, needing transplantation, but as far as organ donors from our community, um, not as many as, as what, what is required. Yes, and, and you are totally right. Uh, the national statistics said that actually 20% of Latinos, uh, or 20% of the people who are in the waiting list are Latinos. 
and only uh, 19, about 15 percent of organs come from the Latino community, so meaning that the, we need to donate more, right? Uh, this was whether is a lack of education or lack of willingness is still debate in debate. The reason why is because uh, when the Illinois start the temporary license uh, driving li license, a lot of people sign up for uh, donation. So I th uh, with that, we thought that the people are asked, people are going to say yes, most likely. Uh, two things, one of them is, do we have the people to ask in a sensitive uh, way and language appropriate way? That is one. And also you, need, you know that it's not about signing when you go to get your driver license or when there is one uh, community event. It's also at the moment that uh, a person is in the state of potential donation, that is the brain death. One, the Latino community understands the brain death or not? And second, the person who is going to approach them is a person that he is uh, appropriate in culturally and lang linguistically. Mm -hmm. I think that those are the, the aspects that we need to review. Because obviously, can you imagine a person being upset because they have a relative who is in a brain death? or they do not know exactly how it is, and somebody comes and asks them in a way that is not culturally appropriate, they are going to donate, most likely they are going to say no. The whole process uh, for me uh, was, uh, as an organ donor with my wife, was very simple. You know, we, it started with a conversation, it started with being educated, and the test is much more, uh, it's much more simple than people believe. It's mm -hmm. not very intrusive. Mm -hmm. Tell us about becoming a, an organ donor. Uh, once I raise my hand to be an organ donor, what happens next? Well, uh, you are registered now then. Uh, what happens is that you are registered. And needs to be, there are some specific conditions that need to happen for an organ to be harvested. We call it the harvest when they are going to be retrieved. And those are that the, the organs need to be alive and the brain needs to be not working anymore. And there are several ways, don't ask me about all the clinical ways, but there are several tests that go around. They test the heart, they test the blood, they test the, some of the enzymes and some of the chemicals that the body is doing to make sure that that person is not coming back. And I think that is the fear for every single one that said, what if I donate the organs and my, my relative is still going to be, it's, it's an opportunity for them to come back. So it's very important that people understand what is the brain death. And once that, I think that if that is the situation also, it's very important for the person that wants to be a donor to talk to the family and to say, my wish is to donate my organs. Uh, the reason why is because if they do not know, and they said, oh, it says here, but he never talked talk about that, so we are not going to allow it. And it's not only you can wish that, but at the end, when you pass away, the ones that are going to make the decisions are your uh, relatives or the next kind. So it's very important to talk about in the family what is, and uh, I think uh, me, coming from another country also, it was kind of difficult to understand the donation. And at the beginning, my husband always says, I'm going to donate my organs, please. You need to know that I'm going to donate my organs. And I was like, okay. And it took a while for me to just uh, get the understanding and say, yeah, I'm going to do it. But you need to understand, I think. And after that, you say, you say that. There is a whole process that is warm and caring because the people who are trained to do this, they really care about you. They are not going to push you to do a decision. They are going to be patient. That is the training that Give Hope has for everyone. And they are going to guide you and uh, to let you to treat the body with respect. Uh, there are hospitals that actually have a line of workers uh, clapping when the body is passing and they are going to be treated really respectful and you are going to be able still to have a burial, still to have an open casket if you decide to do that and all those things are going to be respected. Yeah, and, and, and also um, you could be a living donor like myself, so yes. not necessarily um, at the point of, of passing. Uh, and that's also really important because uh, it, to be a living donor, whether it's kidneys and uh, you can give part of your your liver uh, and even your lung, organs that, that, that grow back when it, in terms of the liver and the lung, um, 
that is also a way to contribute and not necessarily um, at the point of death. And um, I'm, very, I'm very glad that you uh, touched that point because actually the national statistics on organ donation said that the uh, living donation is higher in Latinos. It's 40% versus 30% or 23% in the rest of the population. So the willingness is there. Mm -hmm. We only need to find the ways to ask. Wonderful. Well, we are speaking to Catalina Ramos Hernandez, Program Coordinator of the Illinois Transplant Fund. When we come back, we're going to get a little bit personal. We're going to learn more about Catalina, her upbringing, her background, and what inspires her to do the work that she does. This week on our spring season finale of Change Agents, a Chicago organization that is working tirelessly to support families in underserved communities who have been impacted by autism. We are thrilled to share their story and their incredible work. Tune in this Thursday at 7.30 p.m. on CAN-TV 19, stream Change Agents on CAN-TV.org, or download the CAN-TV Plus app. I look forward to seeing you. We've been talking to Catalina Ramos Hernandez, Program Coordinator for the Illinois Transplant Fund, about the organization's work in giving life-saving organ transplants and follow-up care, the follow-up care to those transplants um, for a healthy and productive life. Now we're gonna take it a little bit personal. So I think it's really important to learn more about the person that we're talking about versus just their title. Tell us about yourself. Where were you born? Where did you grow up? And what inspired you to do the work that you do to today? To do the work, yeah, okay. So my life in five minutes. <laughs> 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 I, I was born in Mexico City, a city girl. And uh, I grew up uh, until the age of 35, 33 in Mexico City. And then I uh, Im immigrated to the United States. And the way is, what they inspired me, it was uh, my parents, of course, and there is not just a line is for real, because my mother uh, didn't want me, I remember didn't want me to play with the adults. She said, that is the way that you grow up to be a mother and stay at home, I want you to do more. And I was like, I didn't know what, was, what more was, but I have that in my mind. And my father was a man that even, I'm talking about many years ago, he knew very well about sexual harassment and he told me, you are going to get a career in the university and you are going to be your own boss. Because w if you go to careers that are lower, you end up having affairs with your boss and they are going to harass you all the time. So with that, I think the message was you need to be independent and you need to grow to, be, uh, to do things more than the traditional women because I grew up in a very, very poor neighborhood. I mean, I'm talking about dirt streets and uh, the majority of people didn't have shoes and all that. So my parents didn't go to the university, but they encouraged us to, do the, uh, to go to the university. It was no way around. So all my family are doctors, lawyers, teachers, because it was it's the way that it was supposed to do. When I was, pr I practiced medicine. I graduated as a medical doctor. I pra practiced medicine for about five years. And one day I realized that I was not doing my job, that the medicine that I had, it was not enough for the community. I did my social service and then I opened clinics in different small parts of Mexico. And it was always that nutrition. I didn't have the money to give food to the people. And the other, it was about the sanitary conditions. The majority were in in infection diseases. I couldn't cure them. I mean, there were big people coming back again and again and every month with the same situation. So I was thinking what I'm doing. I have the opportunity to come to the United States to visit. And I saw this, the places and I said, what am I doing in Mexico? What is it in there for me? And I knew that even undocumented, maybe I could live better here and then in Mexico, so I went back for my children and came back here by myself and documented. And I suffered all the abuse that I could. Even if you are uh, educated, people don't see you that way. Um, you have no history, no support. So I think I start just feeling sorry for myself, but more than anything, fe feeling sorry for the people 
that I knew that they immigra immigrated to the US with the hope to do better. And in reality, the price that they paid to support the families in Mexico. So I started domestic violence. I started sexual assault. I went, I moved a little bit more to the area of uh, health because I said, I'm going to do something here with it. I mean, uh, yeah, I passed the shock passed right the language barrier passed so I said now I need to do something and it's how I came back with wonderful people people who inspire me to do better people who took me and said Catalina I'm going to give you a job here but this is not your home your home is somewhere else you will start here people who sent me to training to learn about the system actually I was a core advocate <laughs> which is totally different than what I was, uh, to do counseling uh, sessions. To, I mean, I learned as much as I could. And with that, I think eventually I became a person in the city that was uh, representing the Latino community in different areas. I was named one of the 100 people, most women most noticeable in the city. In the city. I was awarded. Uh, and celebrated during the royal visit of Princess Diane. I became an advisor for the FDA and the National Cancer Institute. I was a patient advocate. And I just found that being an advocate was my passion. I have all the tools. I had very good education. What else? And I had the people behind me. You are truly inspirational and aspirational. And in telling your story, you, you, know, you, you could see um, the lived experience that you give because entiendes tanto lo que otros han pasado, han pasado yeah. y han tenido que sufrir, that, that they've, they've lived, lived and suffered and had to overcome. And then when they see you, y todo lo que tú has, puedo, has podido uh, cumplir. When they see you, they can say, bueno, si ella puede, yo también. And that's huge. That is so rewarding. I, absolutely. When I see, because I, when I was at Northwestern University, I remember one young boy and said, you are a doctor. And I said, yeah, I don't practice medicine, but I, I, I did my evaluation. And he said, I always wanted to be a doctor. And you see this man who is extremely poor, with tattoos all over. And then I said, what happened with that child to get to this point? Because he had dreams. What happened in between that he th couldn't accomplish that? And, and very much like you said, maybe the person or persons weren't really seeing them, right? Mm -hmm. Like you said, when they weren't seeing you, they were, mm -hmm. or they were just seeing, you know, a stereotypical mm -hmm. image of, of of who who you are. Where you, like so many, like all of us, we have many different layers. Maybe he didn't have that, and maybe, and that's and that's it. Now that's what you're doing. You're you're a letting people who 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 are in doubt have a moment of pause and say, no, 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 no. Tú eres mucho más de lo que otros piensan de ti. Es tener la garra, right? Mm -hmm. You need to have the courage mm -hmm. and the tenacity and maybe even the stubbornness to super Stubbornness. <laughs> stubbornness <laughs> I have been stubborn all my life. Persistent, stubborn. And right now with the patients that I see, I start working with them from um, the time that they are on dialysis. And I tell them, start studying. Study English. Go to a vocational school. I have uh, this network with the schools and uh, city colleges, and I'm always passing around information about what they need to be promoted, because some of them have been 20 years in the same position. The only reason that they are not supervisors is because they do not speak the language. Mm -hmm. So I tell them, go and, go and study. We have actually two people who are starting to be um, dialysis uh, technicians, mm -hmm. because they have the information. They just need to get the degree, and yes, Sí, se, todo se puede en la vida. Todo Tienes que tener eh, la garra. Sí, sí se puede. Catalina Ramos Hernández, muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much for your time. Placer, un placer. When we come back, la última palabra, the last thoughts on organ donation. It's still honest, it's still thoughtful, 
and it's still definitely Chicago. Three, two, one. Join me, Darius Hillman, for a brand new season of In the Arena, where we're bringing you compelling conversations with some of the most fascinating people our city has to offer, right here on CanTV19, on CanTV.org, and the new CanTV Plus app. And now, la última palabra, my final thoughts on organ donation. As mentioned earlier, I am an organ donor. Last year, I was fortunate enough to be able to help my wife Adriana by donating one of my kidneys to her. The transplantation was the second one for her as she underwent a liver transplant nearly 20 years ago. Adriana was born with polycystic kidney and liver disease, a rare condition that causes cysts, fluid-filled sacs, to grow throughout both organs. A healthy liver has a smooth appearance wearing, weighing between three and three and a half pounds. Adriana's polycystic liver, looking like a cluster of large grapes, weighed just over 20 pounds when it was removed. The enlarged liver displaced her other organs, complicating her overall health. Adriana would surely die without a transplant. Her medical miracle happened in her native country of Colombia when doctors told us that an organ donor, a woman who unfortunately died in a car accident, was a match with Adriana. In general, about 75% of people who undergo liver transplants live for at least five years, according to the Mayo Clinic. Adriana will celebrate 20 years with her new liver in November. Since then, we have celebrated two birthdays for Adriana, her date of birth in April and the date of her liver transplant in November. I became an organ donor soon after Adriana's liver transplant. Before then, I was like many Hispanic Latinos who are less likely to donate organs than Americans as a whole, according to organ donation experts. In 2022, nephrologists at Loyola University Medical Center told Adriana that her kidneys were giving out and that she was fast approaching the point of needing dialysis. I quickly volunteered to be tested to see if I could be a living donor for my wife. Adriana was put on an organ transplant waiting list that on average, the wait could be as long as three years. Happily, we learned that I was a solid match to donate my kidney to her, and we had the surgery in June of last year. Although a transplant can be successful regardless of the race or ethnicity of the donor and recipient, there is a greater chance of longer-term survival for the recipient if the genetic background of the donor and recipient are closely matched. Please, please consider becoming an organ donor. Americans from every community are needed to help make a life-saving difference. Persons who register as organ donors can save up to eight lives and enhance the lives of 75 others. Some of those donations can take place while you're living. For example, living donors can give a lung, kidney, or part of their liver, which can almost regrow to its original size. This year, my family added a new birthday for Adriana, celebrating her new kidney, the gift of life and our family's love. And that does it for this edition of Three Questions With a collaboration by Illinois Latino News and Can TV. I invite you to look us up on our websites and chat with us via social media. Tell us what you think about the topics we talked about today, and please send me suggestions about what you think we should talk about in the future. Because at the Illinois Latino News Network, you're more than just our audience. You are our contributors. Amugo Barta, thank you all for listening.